Good evening, and welcome to our History, Theology, and Philosophy lecture series. My name is John Hamer, and I serve as the Meetup Coordinator. Um, by background, I'm a historian, map maker, and theologian, and I serve as pastor of uh, the Toronto Community of Christ, uh, whose, play, whose uh, location here in the city is Toronto Centre Place. We always begin uh, our lecture series and other events with our mission, which is to invite everyone into community, to continually learn and grow, to abolish poverty and end needless suffering, to promote peace and justice, and to live life meaningfully together. Um, as always, we thank you for your contributions. Um, we are right now in a, having been uh, raising money to buy new computers so that we can um, a better stream uh, since we have so much more streaming capacity. If you would like to um, help out with that drive, you can go to centerplace.ca and there are um, buttons there for donations. Um, your gifts are tax deductible in the United States and Canada. Thank you. Um, I'm going to announce our upcoming lectures. It's actually a sequence of lectures the next three Tuesdays. Um, where our focus is going to be on the Book of Mormon. And so if you're not interested in the Book of Mormon, I'm just going to apologize <laughs> that, we're, that we're doing this. Um, but for those of you who are interested and want to take a little bit of a, a deeper dive into a topic, the next three Tuesdays, we're going to talk about first the Book of Mormon's 19th century context and understanding um, how this, what seems like now, quite a weird and odd narrative how it actually fits um, very snugly without any troubles into uh, the time period when it emerged, when it was published. Um, the next week we're going to look at uh, the Book of Mormon authorship um, and different claims that people have made about that, uh, specifically whether it requires uh, a conspiracy or, or for example, supernatural intervention or what the text itself tells us about its author. And then in uh, the last week, October 20th, I'm going to look at, given what we have learned about then the text, uh, if it's not an ancient document, uh, and as we go through it, um, what do its stories mean? What do they, what they tell us about both the 19th century and the context in which it emerged, but also what can those narratives tell us or be of use for us today? Uh, and so that'll be a series, and so hopefully you'll find that um, an interesting deep dive. Um, so we realize that we're up against uh, a pretty important um, and probably high-rated uh, television event in about an hour, and so we understand that um, anyway a lot of you are going to probably going to watch this, and so as a result of that we're going to try to keep this lecture, um, anyway we're going to keep it to within the nine o'clock, and I'm going to uh, be you know watching the time frame as, as we count down and so anyway that's uh, we'll just mention that that means we might not have very much Q&A um, speaking of US politics our topic tonight is a history of the end of the world <laughs> so um, apocalypticism so I think that there's kind of like an ongoing obsession um, with the world's end and destruction and that's, frankly, if we look at it, it's been ongoing for thousands of years. Um, nowadays, we have even more ways than ever about how to imagine uh, the world's end. Of course, there's always been the idea of a divine apocalypse of God destroying the world. But we also now, of course, have nuclear apocalypse. Um, we are very aware uh, in this time of COVID of the idea of a plague and or a super virus that kills everyone off. Uh, asteroid hitting the planet, uh, maybe artificial intelligence uh, taking over and deciding uh, Frankenstein-like that they want to kill all their makers off, aliens coming <laughs> and, and killing everybody. Uh, now in, in fiction too, superheroes, supervillains destroying the world. And of course, um, new, new favorite zombie apocalypse. <laughs> so. Um, definitely um, the ideas of the apocalypse, I mean, they're still very much with us. They were also very, um, uh, very strong when I was growing up. And so 
um, in the 1980s, I was a teenager, and uh, this was a time of a heightened uh, sense of Cold War uh, brinksmanship between uh, the United States and the Soviet Union. And there was, as I recall, well, a, a, a movie uh, called The Day After that I watched with my family that also had kind of a very significant stirring effect, not only on us, but on lots of people. And as people contemplated what it would be like in the fall, in the aftermath of it, of I think what have been a relatively limited nuclear conflict, but nevertheless still amazingly destructive nuclear conflict. And so the kind of day after the day after, um, here's a picture of me and my uh, sisters and uh, brother at uh, in the next year. Uh, my dad um, went and bought backpacks and camping survival supplies that we kept in the garage that, you know, we use in the event of a nuclear war when nuclear war is coming. Um, my parents also even bought a farm way out beyond the suburban ring and kind of made sort of tentative plans that we would all kind of hike that way if in the six, in the situation of like in the, uh, um, the day after where cars stopped working, all this kind of thing, uh, in the event that our hometown where we lived there in Minneapolis had gotten nuked. Um, there was a lot of that in that very same year. So this is um, um, uh, NORAD's War Room, at least as fictionally portrayed in a, another movie from that year, War Games, uh, which was very uh, influential. So the idea of a actual secular apocalypse caused by a showdown between the Cold War superpowers. Um, we had a combo with that, though. <laughs> so on the one hand, um, there was this idea of the, of the um, superpower conflict. On the other hand, um, I was raised in a Mormon household, and there was also a sense that, well, maybe nuclear war is God's plan for the end of the world. And so in our family, Reagan-era nuclear brinksmanship was built onto kind of a pre-existing Mormon ideas about the apocalypse. And so Mormon leaders were teaching that our time is the latter days. So in other words, we are living in the last few days anyway of the, before the end of the world. And as of the 1970s, when I you know, was a kid, it was pretty well anticipated that the end of the world was 20 years in the future, 20, 30 years in the future. And, and actually that's pretty norm. That's for semi-apocalypticists, that's kind of normal. You have a sense that it's gonna be in your lifetime, but like later. And so as a result of that, um, in the 70s and 80s, our family uh, and lots of Mormons uh, regularly had a, a year supply of food that'd be stored in the basement. Would often be, um, we'd eat through the stuff you like, so it'd often be a whole bunch of stuff that you didn't wanna eat for a year, but I guess uh, in the event, you'd, you'd be pretty good. And in fact, actually, I talked to my mom. So my mom continues to keep a bunch of food storage. And, uh, and so for the first four months or so of COVID, she didn't even have to go to the store at all because they were just eating from down in the year supply. So for Mormonism, Mormonism grows out of this 19th century millenarianism um, um, that kind of has been relatively de-emphasized today. So um, back then, uh, when Mormonism got founded in the 1830s, the Latter-day Saint movement really believed a very literal second coming of Christ was absolutely imminent. Um, members believed that the center place of God's kingdom, the New Jerusalem, would be built on the earth in a literal way, and it would be built in Jackson County, Missouri, so in other words, right around Kansas City. Um, and so it was very immediate, very literal. Early member, uh, uh, important member of Martin Harris. He was a guy who was the financier of the Book of Mormon uh, when it was first published. He was so confident that the world was gonna end within two or three years. So he was betting if it didn't end within two or three years, he wagered he'll let the person in, in, the, in the tavern that he was betting, they could have his hand cut off. Uh, he ended up reneging on that bet. <laughs> but in any event, as members then, um, attempted to go and build the New Jerusalem in Missouri. They kind of offended the local settlers, uh, kind of frontiers guys who were not um, keen on all of these kind of hokey uh, end of the world predictions, and they were actually driven out of the county at gunpoint. Nevertheless, that location uh, uh, ended up being very important still for uh, my denomination for Community of Christ. 
Um, so the denomination here, Center Place and Toronto, shares that same origin in the Latter-day Saint movement with the Utah Mormon Church. And so although we no longer uh, generally individual members can believe what they like, but anyway, we no longer envision a literal apocalypse. Nevertheless, the temple headquarters um, in Independence is actually built on that very traditional site of the center place in Jackson County. Um, also, um, in Jackson County, um, members of the church in the 70s and 80s um, got together, for example, to make a kind of a utopia as they were gathering to build kind of like the um, again a kind of a new Jerusalem based on um, I feel like this looks like the Dharma initiative but in other words you're trying to have a uh, communitarian and shared housing things in common so that you can try to build um, an idea of a uh, of a just and equitable um, society um, Utah Mormons too continue to have uh, beliefs in this and they tend to be more more literal so beliefs in a millennium in the Utah LDS Church um, are far more literal anyway than in community of Christ um, many Mormons um, viewed that the construction of a temple in Jackson County would have been a sign that the end is nigh. And so when um, the LDS Church would, has a different idea of temples, when they built a temple in that uh, Kansas City metropolitan area, um, they really built it across the river as far away from as possible from the traditional uh, site to prevent potentially, a lot of people speculate anyway, to prevent their own members from um, starting to panic that the end of the world was about to happen. Nevertheless, um, enthusiasm uh, among Mormon preppers, people who are preparing uh, for the end of the world, sometimes gets overzealous. And so um, LDS leaders even have cautioned against storing too much food. In other words, don't, don't get too nuts about this thing, folks. That doesn't stop people. <laughs> All right. So there's evolving attitudes towards this end, religious and secular, both within um, my particular religious tradition, but also... Um, in society in general and in other other churches and religions. So I want to talk a little bit tonight about apocalypses and apocalypticism and go through kind of a little bit of a history of apocalypticism, look at the literary and religious genre of the apocalypses. I want to look at the book of Revelation from the Christian New Testament in particular. I want to look at how that text is specifically misunderstood today. Um, we'll mention a little bit about doomsday cults, and I want to talk finally about uh, this ongoing popularity of imagining the end. So just to define some of our terms, the word apocalypse and the word revelation. Um, nowadays, apocalypse has come to mean um, cataclysmic destruction, sort of the end of the world. That's not what the word um, initially meant. That's not where it comes from in the original Greek when that word was being applied to uh, books like the book of Revelation that are called apocalypses. Rather, in Greek there, the idea it meant to disclose, as in to disclose information, in the same way that Revelation, in a way, also means that same thing, which is to reveal information. So there is information that hasn't been known before, and this is a book that is disclosing that information or revealing that information. So that's the original idea of it. But because uh, a lot of these involve disclosing ideas about uh, destruction of the world, that's where we make this um, the modern understanding of the term. So revelation is indirect information a prophet composes and discloses in response to inspiration um, I'm going to argue, and not direct information from God. So, uh, so we can't. So, despite how um, people uh, literally understand text, um, the reality is is that uh, in, I'm going to make this theological argument um, that God doesn't actually speak in human words uh, like, it, and prophets aren't just like a dictaphone. Rather, um, people are the people are who composes these texts. Uh, and whether you want to call that inspiration or however, or if you're secular and you don't think of that, uh, however you want to say that, um, these are born out of the immediate context um, and not, uh, not alien to uh, the context that the prophet finds himself in. Um, and so I also want to mention a little bit about the word Armageddon. So we use Armageddon as a... Um, synonym sometimes for the apocalypse or specifically uh, the final battle 
that causes a future cataclysmic destruction. Um, but again, as with, um, that's not the original meaning. The original understanding of Armageddon is actually the name of a, of a past battle. Um, it would be like um, someone's approaching their Waterloo. It's not, in a, it's not actually a future battle in, that, in the sense of whoever's going to uh, you know, have a Waterloo, where the word is coming from Napoleon's uh, uh, last battle, Waterloo, that we're remembering. And same thing, Armageddon has that same original meaning, and it's come to be applied to an idea of a future battle. So where do we get this word Armageddon? So um, in the end of the first temple period, um, this time period before the original destruction of Jerusalem and the taking away of the ancient Israelites into captivity in, in Babylon by the Babylonians, um, what the time period when the earliest parts of the Hebrew Bible were being composed at the time of one of these very important kings, who's king when many of these texts are being written down, King Josiah, um, this king is very praised by biblical authors as the greatest king since David, in part because, again, they're writing when he's king. However, even though um, they predict great things for him, un very unexpectedly uh, in the text, he is very ingloriously killed by a pharaoh of Egypt, Pharaoh Necho, at a town called Megiddo. Um, and so he went up, apparently, what we can just tell in the earliest text of this is that he went up essentially probably to meet the Pharaoh who is going to uh, fight with much greater, against much greater kings, um, and probably is simply just killed at that point by Pharaoh. It's not really actually a battle, um, although it's so inconceivable that this, um, uh, what should have been it should have been a glorious end to this guy and instead he has a very inglorious end and so it's later upgraded into a tragic battle and remembered as a battle but where there's no real evidence that any battle even took place so megiddo here is where we're getting the word armageddon so um uh what about the battle of armageddon in the future so i'm just going to mention that although the book of revelation includes a vision of the kings of the world assembling for battle at Har Megiddo, so that's where we're getting Armageddon. Um, the author does not actually describe a physical battle. Instead, the author of the book of Revelations very clearly is sharing uh, what's a vision, and the vision is has a lot of imagery, and the vision is of the lamb conquering with a sword that emerges out of his mouth. <laughs> And so rather than it being a nuclear missile or something like that, um, what we're really talking about is something emerging from the mouth. And so the imagery here is a sword, which as an, as an analogy for the word of God. In other words, Armageddon in Revelation is a fully metaphorical battle um, that is being fought in the realm of ideas uh, in the sense of people hearing the Christian gospel and being uh, converted to it, not in the sense of any kind of big engagement where, however you want to imagine it, the Russians, the Chinese, and, and the Americans all get together in, in Israel and, and duke it out or something like that. That is not what is being described in any sense in the book. All right, so I want to look a little bit, having gone through that little bit of context, I want to look at the origin of the idea of histories and where did per people first get the idea um, that the world is about to e is going to end, and indeed, that they are actually living at the end of the world. Um, both of those actually come up at about the same time. So, um, one of the things that happens, um, um, so I'll just say, when when a society is pre-literate, uh, they aren't necessarily they're not getting to the situation where they have old books that are out of date. Rather, they are transmitting information orally and they retell it all the time. And even if it maintains its character, which it can for centuries uh, and even longer, uh, it nevertheless is always um, updated as the uh, bards or, or poets or, or the people that are telling the, um, uh, the oral tradition update it for the present time so it's understandable uh, to the people that are around them. 
Uh, and so as a result of that, um, and as a result of that way of transmitting information, preliterate societies often envision themselves in an ongoing cycle of the eternal round. And so everything is always happening and we're always in the same kind of a cycle as the year cycle and the day cycle, uh, these kind of internal rounds. And so picturing history as a line, a timeline, and seeing yourself at or near one end is a much more natural consequence of writing history. So as you start to write down what went before, you begin to remember a more remote past, which is farther and farther removed from where you are at. And so you can kind of see now, boy, this book is really out of date. They're talking about stuff I don't even know what they're talking about anymore. Um, and so that it doesn't happen as easily in, an, in a living oral tradition. Text is dead once it's written down. So part of apocalypticism um, is a kind of thing is what I'll call temporal narcissism. So, um, this is, so this is Doctor Who, right? So if you were a Time Lord with a TARDIS that could take you to any point in time and space, does it make sense that so often you'd end up in late 20th and early 21st century Britain? <laughs> You know, when else would you go, right? So, so because um, obviously the show is filmed, then that's when um, people are continually. That's where the Doctor is continually going to, right? And same thing happens, you know, in Star Trek. So, and they're trying to save the twenty third century and and save the whales and things like that in the movie that takes place in the a movie that is uh, is in the theaters in the year nineteen eighty six. So, so therefore the, the crew in the 23rd century go back specifically to 1986 in order to do that because that's the time period we're in. In other words, this is our um, temporal narcissism. We're thinking about our moment because this is the moment we're in. So in the same way, apocalyptic authors saw themselves as time's end. So, you know, TV and movie writers, we maybe forgive them for using the settings here and now because, frankly, you don't have to build a whole city if you're going to have the crew in the Enterprise walk around San Francisco or have Doctor Who walk around London. You can use the existing buildings instead of having to build whole sets. Um, by contrast, the fact that the authors of apocalyptic texts saw themselves as living in the end of the world, um, I'd say that that actually kind of betrays a, a lack of temporal perspective. So, I mean, the reality is we all kind of do this. We are living uh, now and we look back to the past. Uh, and so then and everything, therefore, that occurs in all of history is before us. And so therefore, we are actually right here at what's the end so far. And as far as we're concerned, as like, for example, if you're um, and a very famous and important apocalypticist from the Middle Ages, Joachim of Fiore, who was living in the 12th century, um, if you're living in the year 1180, the past is all behind you, and it's only natural to observe that you're at the end of the timeline. Nevertheless, history has continued. It's almost a thousand years later now, and we're now at the end of time. There's no time in front of us, but Joachim of Fiore, as far as most of people are concerned in terms of perspective, he might as well be living at the same time as Jesus. It's so long ago for most people that it's just very, very long. It's just all part of a, of a long past. So temporal um, uh, narcissism. So also uh, another, another origin of this is, is that um, uh, early writers and thinkers, prophets like Isaiah, um, they also envisioned a future paradise where things like swords would be beat into plowshares, where the lion would lie down the let with the lamb. However, um, so even though they came up with that, the idea that a new, better world could only arise after the current world was violently destroyed is a little bit later development than Isaiah. Um, part of what happened is uh, influence in um, Abrahamic religions, influence in Judaism and later Christianity uh, by an earlier world religion, Zoroastrianism, uh, which was quite apocalyptic. So uh, Zoroastrianism concerned itself between the cosmic struggle between good and evil. Uh, it predicted a future triumph of good. It, it included the idea of saviors, the destruction of this world, and the creation of an earthly paradise. These are all ideas at the very heart of Zoroastrianism, the religion of the Persian Empire, and all of these became very prominent um, ideas in Second Temple uh, Judaism, which is to say the Persian period when 
uh, Jerusalem was a city of the Persian Empire. Um, so as a result of this time period, in this time period, um, apocalyptic actually replaces that earlier prophetic tradition. So we no longer have prophets like Isaiah who are writing that, but people are still writing Bible-like books. They are now writing, though, a new kind of tradition of books um, that is what we kind of call the apocalyptic tradition. So the earliest texts of the Bible, God is actually envisioned in a less cosmic way, speaking directly, for example, to literary prophets like Moses. Um, as the idea of God, though, becomes more cosmic and remote in the Second Temple period, writers attributed visions to angelic intermediaries, and moreover, they attributed their visions to ancient authorities. And so instead of, um, if you were a writer then in the Second Temple period, instead of going out on the street and announcing that God had spoken to you directly, um, and, and say, thus saith the Lord, as Isaiah might have done in his time, uh, rather, uh, text has become more important. And so instead of actually saying those prophecies out in poetry, like Isaiah would have done, now um, a writer in the Second Temple period, a prophet, will um, write their text out. They'll describe it as a vision um, that is received from an angel. So in other words, not from God directly, uh, but through an angelic intermediary. And they will tend to tribute, attribute their text to an ancient authority like Daniel and Enoch or Adam or Moses or Abraham in order to have their text be um, considered worthy of being in the canon. And so there's actually um, a vast literature, and even though they had this strategy, I've got a whole bunch of this here, you know, there's this text, you know, apocalyptic literature, and this is just big volumes of these that are from this time period. Um, it's, uh, like I say, this is a, it's mostly excluded from the Bible, even though it's attributed to figures like Adam and, and Zephaniah or anyone, everyone, so A to Z. Um, and so we have all of those apocalypses, but they didn't make it in the canon. A very few of those texts did make it into the Hebrew Bible, um, especially uh, prominent in terms of uh, apocalyptic predictions are the books of Ezekiel and Daniel. And actually, beyond the ones that I have in my volumes here, many more are actually discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I'll just give you a little example of how these work from the book of Daniel. Um, the book of Daniel is attributed to a prophet in the Babylonian period, so uh, the middle of the, uh, the 6th century BC, but it's actually written in the middle of the 2nd century BC, so many hundreds of years later, um, by somebody who has, doesn't know very much about the Babylonian period at all. Um, in the, the text, Daniel's visions are brought by the angel Gabriel, and they're very remarkably specific and accurate in terms of their predicting various historical events up to the year 167 BC. And then after the year 164, they continue to be predictions that are more vague, uh, but those predictions all fail. And so the fact that the author, for example, knew you know, what would happen between 600 and, and 167 and then did not know what was going to happen after 164, we can tell when they were writing, right? So they're writing in that time period uh, when the other events had happened. So the author of the Daniel um, shares two central characteristics of apocalyptic writers. And these are one, the belief that they themselves are um, immediately living at the end times. And two, <laughs> they're totally wrong in their predictions. Um, and this is just quite normal. People who have this idea, they're not at the end of the times. We can tell very well that even though the, uh, the author of Daniel believes that what has happening right then in the second century BC was a signal that the world was ending in a very particularly short amount of time, um, that is not the case. So it proved not to be true because obviously um, it's now more than 2000 years later and that did not happen. Um, so a characteristic failure of apocalyptic prediction. So it, Ezekiel um, had predicted the world's end in his own time and that, that failed. Mm -hmm. And so the author of Daniel took, uh, reinterpreted the time frame uh, mentioned in Ezekiel so that the end of the world would occur, you know, in his day. When Daniel's prediction failed, uh, in other words, so when the world didn't end it around in the second century BC, uh, the, John the Revelator, the person who wrote the 
book of Revelation, um, he decided to reinterpret the time frame so that the end of the world would occur in his day. So in other words, the text is still important. The idea that the world is ending is still important. And so now he changes the math, which very literally would have, if, if interpreted literally, would have meant it, uh, it would have happened in the second century. Instead, now it's changed so that uh, the calculation can make sense that, um, that at the end, around the year 100 AD is going to work. And so anyway, the failure of the prophecy has resulted in ongoing recalculations. So in other words, John the Revelator also believed that he was living in the end times. Here we are 1900 years later and people have to then reinterpret what he's saying. So what happens when prophecies fail like that? You'd think that if um, these apocalyptic writers, the authors of Ezekiel, Daniel, uh, of, of the book of Revelation, when they make clear predictions that don't happen, um, Shouldn't that make people say, oh, well, they were wrong then. They're a false prophet or a failed prophet. Uh, really, that's not how it tends to work. <laughs> and so um, there is an amazing um, uh, hubbub in the 1840s. Uh, a guy uh, named uh, Miller who uh, led a group called the Millerites. Um, they had done, he'd done all the calculations and he determined that the world was going to end on 1843, later figured out, okay, no, that wasn't right. I guess it was 1844. Um, and they even went so far as to sell possessions. They all gathered together on top of a hill and, and, and they were all in on this thing because they knew the world was going to end and then it did not end. Uh, and so as a result of that, they call that time period the great disappointment. And you might think that, well, they just would say, well, Miller really didn't know what he was talking about and, uh, and that would be that. Um, but that isn't what happened. So, you know, although the Millerites believed that the world would end in 1844, the prophecy's failure didn't end the movement. Rather, after the Great Disappointment, all kinds of different uh, successors to Miller um, ended up reinterpreting um, his, again, his calculations and understanding what was going on. And so uh, all of these different movements then have emerged out of that early Millerite disappointment. And now there's still today 22 million members in different successor churches, the largest of which are the Seventh-day Adventists who have maybe 19, 18 or 19 million members. Um, and so a lot of cases what happens is um, that just because there's a, a failure of a prophecy doesn't mean uh, that anybody is abandoning their original belief. Um, in part, this is because of human nature and the sunk cost fallacy. So here we have our little cartoon dance illustrating the sunk cost fallacy. So a little dog here believes that he's buried his bone right here and he gets to digging. And now he's dug such a big hole. Um, you know, the other dog is like, you know, I don't think your bone is down there. He says, but I'm so deep, I can't stop now. And so he keeps digging and digging, even though he's very clearly digging in the wrong place, but he doesn't want to abandon this hole that he's spent so much effort in, right? Uh, and so this is the um, truism or aphorism, in for a dime, in for a dollar. Once you've already uh, thrown a dime in, even though you lost that dime, you're going to continue to invest. You know, now you're going to invest a dollar because you're invested in, frankly, the failure. And so um, some people do when prophecy fails, leave. But a lot of people or more maybe even are actually end up being stronger devotees or disciples. So... Um, I just want to, uh, you know, make the case, you know, rather than um, rather than fo follow after the the sunk cost fallacy or in for a dime and for a dollar, people should use the other aphorism and say, don't throw good money after bad. So once you've already lost the money, it's lost and you can't get it back. So don't don't throw good money after bad. All right. So spectacular failure of apocalyptic prophecy is just as likely to result in increased loyalty of followers because of the sunk costs um, rather than uh, their disillusionment. Uh, adopt, apocalyptic doctrines can tend to function like conspiracy theories. And so, for example, a besieged group like uh, here, the People's Temple, uh, Jonestown, um, they believe they have a share, a special knowledge that elite experts lacked, and so that they all share together, and that um, gives them a strength identity. And so they're actually able to, uh, like conspiracy theorists, like the QAnon folks, um, they're able to feel strengthened, even though they are bought into something that isn't the case. Um, in the same way that we have uh, chronocentrism, we also have um, kind of textual centrism. 
Um, people love to read ancient texts and they immediately think it's referring to them themselves right here and now. Um, but the reality is when you read the book of Revelation, it's not about you or your time. Um, the author of this and the author of all ancient texts is not speaking to our day. They're not envisioning our day. What they are doing is they're speaking to their own community at the time that they're living. They're writing for a very particular purpose. They're writing to people in their own time period. Um, so even though apocalyptic authors are suffering from a lack of perspective um, and they falsely believe themselves to be living at the end times, um, they're writing to uh, the, the readers who read them now also have that same lack of perspective and they falsely imagine that the texts refer to the reader's time, which is to say my time if I'm reading this right now, when in fact they actually refer to the author's time. So future history reading of Revelation is not new. For centuries, people have been reading the book of Revelation as if it was a future history. Um, and people who think this are often convinced the signs that they see in the book uh, um, report, think to their, uh, point to the idea that their own times are the beginning of the end. I've called this temporal narcissism or chronocentrism. Um, this has been going on for a long time. I've mentioned before Joachim of Fiore, uh, who uh, was in the 12th century. He used the book of Revelation to predict that the world would end around the year 1260. So he actually put it more than, um, you know, more than 60 years after his death. So he, he was giving people a little bit of time in terms of his calculation as opposed to uh, what some people sometimes do. And so as a result of what he did, though, he did kind of a new thing with the text. And in fact, he actually identified um, a, a vision in the text, the seven headed beast with historical figures beginning with King Herod, so in Jesus's time, uh, and leading to Saladin, uh, the leader of uh, the Muslim forces against the Crusaders in Joachim's own time. And so in other words, leading to Saladin and then the Antichrist who was already born in Joachim's time, but who would only um, you know, precipitate the end of the world uh, by the year 1260. And so essentially he's identified it from his perspective and his place in history, um, what these seven figures would have represented, right? And, for, and so again, Saladin being the contemporary who uh, medieval Christians at, in Joachim's time is, is the most concerned with. So um, Protestants at the time of the Reformation then used images of level, revelation to label the papacy as antichrist. And so this is a, um, a 16th century uh, a woodcut from Martin Luther's Bible. It's representing the, the vision of the whore of Babylon. And you can see um, the whore of Babylon here is wearing a papal crown, right? And so um, again, it's updated for, uh, it's updating the text, reading it to read in uh, Luther's own time and biases. Um, you know, and, and Catholics gave as good as they got. So come Catholics in return, identified Luther as the antichrist. <laughs> Uh, and so in, in both cases, what they're doing is they're taking a first century text and they're reading their own 16th century issues into the text. Um, early modern thinkers like Isaac Newton, you know, so we think of him primarily because of all of his amazing work as a scientist. He actually spent as much time or more studying the Bible in order to predict the future as he did inventing things like calculus. <laughs> He should have spent more time on calculus and less time on, on the Bible because his reading of the book of Revelation and his book on the book of Revelation um, is largely, I would say, a mess and isn't worth anything. But in any event, he argues that the text does everything from predict the conversion of Constantine uh, to the fall of Constantinople. So in other words, all of these important events as Isaac Newton saw them at his point in history at the beginning of the 18th century. So common modern ideas about the book of Revelation actually have nothing to do with the actual text. So you may have heard of something called the rapture. Um, there is no mention of the rapture in the text at all. The word antichrist, <laughs> if you, it does not appear in the text. Um, and the author's intent, uh, you know, in terms of what is actually in the text, the author's intent is actually to convey a message of hope to his contemporaries, and it's not meant to convey a message of fear to people in the far future. Um, the book of Revelation is actually its own book. 
Um, and so this image of the rapture that you might have heard from modern fundamentalist uh, Christians, um, it's drawn from other biblical texts. So for example, the second Thessalonians and some of the sayings from the sayings gospel Q that are found in Matthew and Luke and are misinterpreted to un be understood as this thing, this rapture when Christians are going to be taken up into the heavens at the, right at the end times. Uh, that is not in the book of Revelation at all. Uh, likewise, the name Antichrist actually comes from the letters 1st and 2nd John, uh, which is often then conflated with the image of the beast in Revelation. But again, they're not known, to, those texts wouldn't be known to the author of Revelation and they aren't, aren't actually relevant in such Revelation needs to be read on its own. Um, although Revelation is generally misread as a future history, um, this idea when the four horsemen are going to be loosed, war, famine, pestilence, and death, they're going to be loosed on the earth. And um, the reality is um, famine, war, pestilence, and death already are loose on the earth. Um, the book of Revelations is actually envisioning a world where they're going to be eliminated. So this idea that uh, they've been loosed on the earth, that's something that happened in the way past. We have death, we have war, we have pestilence. They're all here with us. Uh, the book of Revelation is envisioning a time uh, when they will be uh, eliminated. And so the core narrative actually of the book of Revelation is the destruction of the beasts of injustice. So although Revelations is sometimes read as God sending these horrific monsters to destroy the world, the text is actually about God quote, destroying those who destroy the world. And so the vision then uh, is the vision of ending injustice, not of God pouring out uh, four horsemen of, onto earth. Those are already with us. I'm also going to say that um, um, one of the things that's kind of central to the text that doesn't get remembered very much at all by um, apocalypticists who are, you know, wanting to get raptured and hoping that everybody who's not is going to have have some horrible end, um, that actually the text uh, concludes with a very hopeful vision of a new Jerusalem. Um, the new Jerusalem is presented as uh, this open city that has open gates. In other words, it's not a city with walls. It's where everyone can come and go as 24 open gates and it's just and inclusive. It's a just society where pain, suffering, and even death have been defeated. Ultimately, it's a word picture of a just kingdom of God um, that is like what Jesus describes when he says, blessed are the poor. So this idea of a, a fully just, upside down, inclusive uh, new kingdom um, when uh, that will exist at some time in the future when uh, war, death, pestilence, plague have all been uh, eliminated. So <laughs> to, to sum up, and I've gone maybe fast because I've been concerned that I, we, we um, uh, you know, because we got the debate coming up here, the apocalypse the, in, in, in politically, politically <laughs> is, uh, anyway, to sum up, uh, apocalypse is an apocalypticism. Um, I like this, uh, the end is, is Thursday. Um, you're better off if you're not like Miller, you don't actually say the exact date, right? You're better off saying it's near, like... Um, we thought when I was a kid that it was maybe 20 years off as opposed to uh, continuously setting a date. Although, you, again, you don't always get in trouble for it. You can always set a new date. Although um, all biblical apocalyptic prophecies refer to times that have passed and have therefore, frankly, failed, um, their ongoing reinterpretation and indeed misinterpretation is, is continuing. Um, Unfortunately, in the case of like smaller new religious community, communities like Jonestown, um, the urgency that can be derived from immediate end times uh, can dangerously empower leaders. And so really crazy and bad things can happen when people's um, eternal priorities are, are shifted to the point where everything has to happen now because of um, doomsday, a doomsday clock that is ticking super fast. Um, nevertheless, if current popular culture is any indication of the trend, um, taking delight in the world's end will will be with us till the end of the world if, you know, if it comes in any of the number of ways that unfortunately uh, we're facing with the various global problems that we're either facing or 
um, not actually facing because of uh, widespread denial of the issues. And so that is my take on uh, apocalypses and apocalypticism on the history of the end of the world. And so I did it in enough time that we can have some questions. So we have some time for questions. I'm going to end. We're going to try to end at 10 minutes before the hour. So you have time to um, watch, um, you know, get ready to watch the debate and find, figure out how to get that on. And so if there have been any questions or I'll invite any questions, I know I went really fast. And so if there's any need for clarification, um, we'll see if Leandro has any. I'm ready. <clears throat> so Emma Gazarian asks, was John the Revelator John the Disciple? Um, and and the answer to that is no. So if we think very clearly, although um, although different people at different times in history have have made that claim or have wanted that to be the case or have believed that the case um, in antiquity people even a lot of people were were pretty aware if um, if you read Greek which I do not but I have read uh, uh, authors who um, anyway who've talked about this um, the Greek of the book of Revelation is is very strange and very very different than um, the Greek that is used in the gospel uh, according to John. Um, and so um, we can tell very clearly that these are, are different authors. The book of Revelation, I've heard described as being written in almost a kind of a street Greek. And so it's almost like, um, like rapper kind of Greek or something like that, you know, this kind of a thing. So it is using all kinds of crazy slang and other kinds of terms that is, are very different uh, from that. So it's a regular, what, what, what we say is it's a John was a common name. Um, uh, what we can say is that this is a, a different Christian prophet um, of the late first, early second century, late first century, who is writing um, uh, his own um, letters to uh, the churches in Anatolia that includes this, this vision. Um, Elizabeth Bach says, American pie uh, seems to me to be about the end of the world. <laughs> I don't know much, if anything, about uh, the rock and roll music in it. Uh, the three men I admire most, I'm trying to think if this, is, if this is the song, the three men I admire most, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, they took the train to the coast, and this is what they said on his way to Armageddon. Uh, Tom Lehrer, so long, Mom, I'm off to drop the bomb. So I, I wish Elizabeth was here to sing that for us. <laughs> um, and she says, I have also, also acquired a song called Before the Oceans Rose, where the speaker is a child about uh, 2050 describing the world of his great grandfather. Yeah, so there's some good um, science fiction uh, um, history about uh, this impending, like after the calamity. And um, and I, re I'm, I remember some... some uh, kind of chilling stuff like when I was a kid too reading about like how um I don't know like people in the future who don't have this energy society who don't aren't living they're living a much simpler life because of the collapse of uh the energy economy and things like that who were like skateboarding on the remains of an interstate highway or something like that because you know that that nobody makes those anymore because not all of this kind of cars and things like that don't exist in this in this um simpler more primitive future um another uh, there's all kinds of other post-apocalyptic literature like the postman and things like that that are coming from that time um <clears throat> ron wagner <clears throat> says muslims also believe in an end time uh do jews so um so jews of the time of jesus very frequently did not ever not everyone there was all kinds of different sects but so for example um the the sect that is at Qumran that created the Dead Sea Scrolls they very much believed in a, in an end times, and they um, had their own apocalyptic texts, including some of these popular apocalyptic texts. 
Um, I would say that because this is less, um, some several of these kinds of um, features of Second Temple Judaism that get uh, focused into Christianity are less into the text that made it into the Hebrew Bible. And so they are in Daniel, they are in Ezekiel to an extent. Uh, but as a result of, of these later apocalypses, like this text that I have not making it into um, Jewish scripture, it's far less emphasized um, uh, than it would be um, in, in Christianity or Islam. Uh, Elizabeth also says there was a skit in Beyond the Fringe that parodies the Millerites. Um, they wait for the end of the world, it doesn't happen, and then they say, well, see you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess every week, every every day, they, they go wait up on the hill for the end of the world. And then when it doesn't happen, they say, see you tomorrow. So yeah, there's always those kind of s silly, it's hard for even a, a fervent believer to divorce themselves from their daily routine, right? So you, 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 um, you, you still make your dentist appointment, you know, for next month, even though you think the world is ending today, right? <laughs> so um, Peter Bennett's, Paul Bennett's, I'm sorry, watching from, uh, uh, Olathe, Kansas, uh, just down the road from where the day after was filmed in Lawrence. Yeah, um, I think we even had some church members who were extras in the film. Yeah, it. I remember it pretty vividly, and I think I've only ever seen that movie when it aired on TV. You know, in the '80s, like that. And so, um, I, it's could be. It should be interesting to go back and rewatch that. Um, and I, I even kind of remember. You know, like again, that kind of Kansas setting that you're talking about as a result of that, it just made a big imprint. So that's really neat though that, um, anyway, that you guys were right there and maybe even some of the church members were extras in the film. Uh, Johan Kuslag says, um, Dr. Strangelove and On the Beach were movies that I remember from my youth about the end of the world that were quite influential in my formative years. Yeah, so um, I haven't seen On the Beach, but I can just say Dr. Strangelove is, I think, one of the best movies of, of all time. And um, and it's, yeah, very much, um, <laughs> you know, very much a commentary on on this on kind of the end of the end of the world. And and, you know, the Russians making their doomsday machine and, and device and, and a preemptive strike on the on behalf of a uh, kind of a crazy conspiracy theorist general in the uh, the U.S. Air Force. So, yeah. Um, that was definitely, you know, very much of of the era and the brinksmanship that was happening was very real. I mean, in a lot of cases, people are not even aware sometimes or retrospectively, we only find out how close uh, the superpowers got to doing different things that would have been uh, very devastating. Um, Jordy Frames says, Buddy Holly was... Uh, 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 John the Revel Revelator, um, the teacher of Papias. So, um, so there is this tradition, and I'm trying to think of who writes that, if it's Eusebius who's writing about this. Um, there is a sense that they have in, um, uh, in Ephesus, in, in, in Anatolia, that there are um, connections between um, John the Johannine community between um, the Apostle John potentially and um, and then later people, Papias and other um, uh, other early church leaders. But I think that the um, I think that those recollections are late and they don't they aren't very well attested. So I don't um, think that we have anything um, that scholars find to be a compelling connection, especially between John the Revelator and and uh, and any 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 other connection with him, um, and so this is a text that actually um, some people. I mean, it got copied, and because people thought might since it was John, they thought it might be the same John as John the Apostle. Actually, what we can say is that um, that none of the none of the texts that are attributed to John, including the Gospel of John, the letters of John, are actually by um, the historical figure, uh, the Apostle John, who we know as an actual actual um, historical figure because Paul, who is an actual historical figure, um, met this person. Um, but none of the texts are likely at all or uh, almost any chance of being um, by um, that actual historical figure. They're rather they're texts that are either written in, um, in attributed to that uh, apostle or written in his name, 
or in the case here of, of John the Revelator, he doesn't actually make the claim that he is um, the apostle and doesn't, the text uh, in different places talks about the 12 and things like that. And in no way does it indicate that, uh, that the author considers himself to be one of the 12 or is pretending to be one of the 12 or anything like that. But, um, uh, but people, some people thought it was or early Christians, a lot of them reading the Greek and knowing the Greek, um, didn't agree. And so this is actually why the book of Revelation was the last book to be agreed upon for the canon of the Christian New Testament. And especially in the Greek East, um, they were less likely to include it all the way up until like the fifth and sixth century. So sometimes they would and sometimes they wouldn't. So it, um, it, it's, we don't have a lot of anything more about where it came from, except for the internal evidence as you read the text itself. So um, in writing his letter to the different churches in Anatolia at the beginning of the book of Revelation, John describes uh, himself, he describes himself as being on the island of Patmos and, the, and so on. Uh, and so from clues in the text, as with so many ancient texts, um, clues in the text are almost all we are able to do in terms of this character's, the author's biography. Well, folks, I think we should probably um, wrap it up because we uh, got, I want to watch the debate too. <laughs> and so I, uh, I know this went fast and I appreciate um, uh, you sticking with us despite a kind of an abbreviated timeline here. And we will see you next week as we kind of start our dig deep into um, the, our survey of the Book of Mormon.